energy coupling, the heartfelt story of how phosphate groups repeatedly get used and discarded, yet are still full of energy and willingness to help. The textbook definition of energy coupling is the use of an exergonic reaction to fuel an endergonic reaction. But what's the difference between exergonic and endergonic reactions? Well, in an exergonic reaction, energy gets released in the products, whereas in an endergonic reaction, energy must be absorbed by the reactants in order for the reaction to occur. Exergonic reactions are spontaneous, meaning that they can occur on their own, while an endergonic reaction is non-spontaneous, meaning that it can't occur on its own since it must absorb energy in order to happen. In an exergonic reaction, delta G quantifies the amount of energy released as a negative value. Whereas in an endergonic reaction, delta G quantifies the amount of energy that must be absorbed as a positive value. By showing the differences between exergonic and endergonic reactions, the textbook definition of energy coupling begins to make more sense. Because an exergonic reaction releases energy and can occur on its own, while an endergonic reaction can, pairing an exergonic reaction with an endergonic can give the non-spontaneous reaction the boost of energy it needs to occur on its own. The concept of energy coupling is essential in order for countless endergonic biological processes to occur. An example of this is how the human body removes ammonia, a substance toxic to humans at high concentrations from tissues in the body. Here is one of the reactions involved in that biological process. Glutamate reacts with ammonia to form glutamine, an endergonic reaction which is indicated by its positive delta G. Therefore, in order for this reaction to occur, it must energy couple with an exergonic reaction. One of the most common exergonic reactions in energy coupling is the breakdown of ATP. When the reactions energy couple, the delta G's of the two reactions get summed up into a new negative delta G, making the overall process spontaneous. Now let's zoom into this process even further to see how the exergonic reaction gives the endergonic reaction enough energy to occur spontaneously. In general, the bond between the second and the third phosphate of ATP is very unstable, which is why the breakdown of ATP into ADP and phosphate is spontaneous. When used in an energy coupling reaction, this phosphate bonds to glutamate, thus giving it the boost of energy needed to react with ammonia to form glutamine. Here are the two reactions that occur during the energy coupling. To better understand concepts, I like to personify them. So think of the phosphate as the energetic person no one has the energy to deal with for long periods of time. ATP, tired of having to deal with its third phosphate, gives it to glutamate to cheer it up since it's sad that it doesn't have enough energy to react with ammonia. This forms a phosphorylated intermediate, which is a molecule that's more reactive than it was originally due to the added phosphate. Glutamate, in the form of phosphorylated intermediate, now has enough energy to react with ammonia to form glutamine. This is what I meant earlier when I said that the exergonic reaction fuels the endergonic reaction. However, just like ATP, the phosphorylated intermediate can't deal with the phosphate for too long, so it lets the phosphate go once it becomes glutamine. So let's give the phosphates out there some appreciation. Despite being used and discarded, they still maintain their helpful energetic demeanor. Now they're the real ones.